Good morning. I'm Dr. Kathleen McInnes, a senior fellow in the International Security Program and the director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. I am honored to welcome and introduce our guest today, Gabrielis Landsbergis, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. Minister Landsbergis has a crucial role in shaping Lithuania's foreign affairs and security policy agenda, which includes preparing for the 2023 NATO summit in Vilnius, the transatlantic partnership between the United States and Lithuania, and responding to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. All topics that my colleague Daniel Feda, a non-resident senior advisor to the International Security Program and former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO Policy, will talk about with the Minister today. Thank you, Minister Landsbergis, for joining us, and over to you, Dan, to get us started. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. Mr. Minister, Labas Ritas. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Kathleen has said, your visit comes at a very important time. There's no shortage of issues uh, to be discussed. I understand you met with Secretary Blinken yesterday. Um, I'm sure the, the, the plate was full. Uh, today, I want to uh, have a conversation with you that involves Ukraine, that involves China, that involves Russia, that involves the Vilnius Summit, which I, by my math is about four months away. Uh, but maybe what we could start with is, uh, again, you met with Secretary Blinken yesterday. Uh, tell us about the state of U.S.-Lithuanian relations and how is that looking? Well, I know that it sounds, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a great Not pleasure. Uh, but um, it sounds uh, as, a, as a phrase that uh, anybody could use, uh, but I think that we have not ever been in a more closer and better relations with the United States um, throughout our independence, um, the decades of our independence. Uh, we've always felt uh, the shoulder of, of U.S. whenever we've uh, engaged in our path for NATO membership or even independence and, and non-recognition policy, so it, it spans decades. But now currently we are on the same page when it comes to a lot of issues, not just Ukraine, not just what is happening in the uh, in the vicinity of, of Lithuania towards to the east, but more about uh, mm, the defending what is called the global rules-based uh, world order. So we support each other when it comes to uh, China's coercion, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to China coercing others, uh, not just Lithuania that we had uh, in, in, in last 18 months. So I think that it's truly a, a new page uh, which sets uh, hopefully a tone for the decades to come. Uh, that's great. Uh, having been involved with U.S.-Lithuanian relations for a long time now, uh, I've always been pleased by there's a continuity. Uh, continuity on our side, continuity uh, on your side. Um, so that's great to hear that in your conversations with the Secretary it's in the same. Um, I also want to uh, talk to you uh, about Ukraine now. And so, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, when I interned in the foreign ministry uh, 25 years ago now, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, sit down with your grandfather, uh, Vitautas Landsbergis, uh, and talk about uh, Freedom's March for Lithuania, the role he played, but also the role that the Lithuanian people played. As we look at Ukraine today, uh, Lithuania is right there at the for forefront in terms of supporting uh, the country, its march to be able to maintain freedom. Um, from where you sit in Lithuania and then from the conversations you had here, um, explain to the American people and those that are watching, why does Ukraine matter? You know, as they say, that um, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So I can, uh, I can assure you that there's a lot of r rhyming mm -hmm. uh, for uh, Lithuanian ear to what history is, uh, is offering all of us today. Um, you know, just yesterday, in, during my conversation with, with Secretary Blinken, I've, I've mentioned one historic uh, fact that is, uh, now fades a little bit into the pages of history, but for us it's still quite alive. It's the independence of Lithuania that we regained in 1990. Uh, so Lithuania was the first country from the Soviet Union to declare independence. And basically, uh, with the recognition, it meant that Soviet Union is dissolving. And um, for us, you know, it was a fight, it was a struggle for, for our sovereignty, you know, and bringing us back on the map, because we waited for so long for that, for that to happen. Um, not everybody was in favor of that. 
And when you look back, you say, you know, it's a question of why wasn't it so? Why would you not agree that people mm -hmm. have a self-determining uh, right to be to be free, to be, you know, to democratically elect their government and all, all these things that were, you know, ringing the bell since 1918 uh, with the spring of, uh, of, of nations. Why would you like uh, us to stop? Because some of the countries uh, actually asked us not to do this. Um, and I explained that to myself, that there was a, a fear, uh, probably a geopolitical fear, of imagining uh, Soviet Union dissolving or losing sure. the, the Cold War, uh, not escalating. You know, because uh, the fall of Berlin Wall was escalation enough. Mm -hmm. So if you have Lithuania breaking free, then it's, it's escalatory. So how Soviet Union could, could react? And I had a chance to thank the United States for not being afraid then. Following the history on its course and allowing the history to happen. And out of that history, out of that victory, you know, you have an independent country, a member of your EU and NATO. Yeah. You have a you know, foreign minister that's able to arrive in DC and have all the conversations uh, represent uh, my country. Uh, so the victory, geopolitical victory, you know, brought something, something very beautiful. So, and this rhymes, as I said, yeah. with what we're seeing in, in Ukraine. Are we not, some of us in the West, afraid of what will happen if Russia loses? And I think that there is this, you know, can you imagine a nuclear power, a permanent member of Security Council, losing a war against that much smaller uh, neighbor that it started, but still losing? So maybe it could not lose, it should not lose. Maybe we have to put a pillow somewhere so that when it falls, you know, the, the, the fall would not be so um, so painful and I'm reminding everybody look you know we were not afraid then we should not be afraid now Russia has to lose they started this they has to lose they have to lose and Ukraine has to win and out of that victory you will have peace that everybody is wishing for and most of all, most of all Ukrainians themselves so you're touching on you use the pillow analogy <clears throat> what I have heard when I've traveled uh, back and forth through Europe over the past year since the war has started is, and we've seen it in some of the press accounting, that uh, there's a concern not to humiliate uh, Putin, to humiliate Russia, but really we're talking about Putin here. Um, and therefore, use the pillow analogy, soft landing. Um, I take by your comments that that shouldn't be a factor, but how do you deal with that factor? And I do believe there's a Western European view on Putin and an Eastern European view on Putin. So how do you reconcile that? I think, well, first of all, uh, we have to admit that there's a lot more convergence when it comes to the views from eastern part of Europe and the western part of Europe. Um, You're saying there is more convergence than divergence? Yes, there is more convergence than before. I see. Yeah, so we, we are converging. You know, the, uh, there is more central position when it comes to the uh, situation right now. In 2014, it was way more different. In 2008, it was even more different. Right. In 2000s, when Lithuania joined the EU, and we were saying, look, you know, uh, if you take, you know, you've, you've met my grandfather, if you take his position in 2000s, it would not be very much different from what he's saying right now, mm -hmm. or what I'm saying right now, or, you know, Lithuania, or Latvia, Estonia, for that matter, are saying right now. So, in, in principle, we were always saying that, look, you know, Russia is an imperialistic power, uh, actually an empire, resembling 19th century empires of, of uh, European continent, who has not fallen, who has not failed yet. And it still has all the DNA of, of that uh, modus operandi. That means that it looks into uh, its neighborhood as a sphere of influence, uh, asking others not to choose their security guarantees mm -hmm. that would somehow infringe with theirs, and all these things. And that it could, from, from that mindset, aggression might arise. So we were th saying that in, in 2000. Yeah. We were alarmist, uh, we were paranoid, and all these things. You know, we had a troubled history with Russia. That drives our you know, policy. Um, in 2008, we said, look, you know, is that not you know, when Russia attacked Georgia yeah. for the first time? Is that not enough for us to stop and think whether, you know, whether Russia is actually what we in the West think that it is? No, 2014, once again, not really. And now, that's why I'm saying that there is a lot more convergence, that actually we can agree that Russia is an aggressive neighbor right. 
that we do not want to have any, any business with. Now the question is, do we really see how much of a threat Russia is? And I, I have to say that we're not there yet. For, for me, for my country, and I would probably say that for many countries on the eastern flank, is Russia is an existential threat, a vital threat. When we're talking about Russia threat, we're not saying, you know, it's a political debate between the parties. So, you know, there's a left-wing party who thinks that Russia is not that big of a threat, and I'm coming from the right, I would say that is a bigger threat. No. It's a threat to the people of Lithuania. That actually when we think about Russia, we think about Bucha, we think about Irpin, we think about Dnipro, uh, and, and other, other places in Ukraine, which were so vivid to everybody, and we imagine same thing happening in our countries. And that picture is not relevant so much yet in France, in Germany, because for them, it's still a part of the political debate. Mm -hmm. For us, it's not that. So, and then again, going back to the previous question, when we're saying, okay, so what needs to happen in Ukraine? We would always say, Ukraine has to win. It has to be the final chapter of Russia's aggression. Because if Ukraine does not win, it will continue, and God knows where we're next. So that's, yeah, you, you've sort of uh, answered one of my questions, which was, you know, how do we think the war is going? You certainly uh, can expand on that. But um, I'm with you, and everything that you just said about Ukraine has to win. Um, and we can debate about what full victory means. Certainly, however this war ends, it has to be on Ukraine's terms, and then whatever that means territorially. Right. But there is a scenario in which Ukraine is not able to achieve all of its objectives. I'm not going to say lose, and I'm not going to say have to quit, but it may not achieve all of its objectives. In that scenario, what, how would Russia uh, perceive that if they're not, quote unquote, defeated? And what does that then mean for European security? Well, I think that the loss of Russia has to be admitted from Russia, from within Russia. The loss has to be admitted within. So within the psyche of the yeah, Russian they, people. Yeah, they, they have to admit that they lost, like they lost in, in Afghanistan. You know, when you retreat in, uh, from, uh, from Afghanistan with all your troops, uh, you know, general waving, uh, you know, the, the, last, the last person, see, you know, seeing the last troop uh, leave Afghanistan, you cannot say that that was a victory. Russia retreating from, uh, from China and, and, you know, from the battle with Japan in 1904, mm -hmm. uh, five, sorry. Um, again, you cannot say that that was a victory. Um, probably the, the worst, uh, I mean, geopolitically and looking at, a bit to the future, is that, and again, victory or loss, it's a political concept as well, as, as is this military. Sure. So I'm you know, trying to, to drive the point uh, forward that they have to admit that they lost politically as well. That means that uh, people who give a mandate to Putin, and I'm not saying the voters, but those who mandate him for his actions have to admit that this is it. That was a devastatingly bad decision, flawed to its core, and it cannot be repeated. And then, and that is a political, political sure. decision. And then this is where we would start to think that we might be on a safer path for European, for European continent. Yes, there would be change in Russia. I, you know, I'm quite confident that that, that will happen uh, sooner or later, but that will start seeing that Russia changes its modus operandi, that the empire is changing from, from within. If that doesn't happen, and Putin is able to present whatever action on the ground as its victory, then it's a, it's a dangerous new page for European continent. That's one thing. So it's, uh, we definitely have to start preparing, if we haven't decided that yet, yep. uh, for defending not just Ukraine, not just Georgia and Moldova, which will be very much on the front, but also the eastern flank of, of NATO. And I would probably start with, with, the Baltic, uh, with the Baltic states. Additionally to that, a perceived Russian victory, uh, we have to remind ourselves that no boundaries friendship 
between okay. China and Russia is, uh, might work differently when Russia has accepted its loss and when Russia has perceivably won the war. So that means that creates a partnership, no boundaries, between wo Russia that has won yep. and ever aggressive China. So this path, the global path for, for global security, is quite a dangerous one. Uh, it's probably better to, um, for all of us <laughs> involved and, and, and worried about the future of our global security is uh, to have Russia admitted that, it's lo that it has lost as a partner also to, to China. Um, I want to come back to U Ukraine proper in a, in a moment, but are you seeing uh, any uh, uh, DOD, Pentagon term, any prudent, prudent planning being done across Europe for an alternative outcome other than Ukraine winning? I can tell you where I sit, I'm not seeing it, but is to the scenario where Russia does not accept defeat, uh, somehow is able to claim some victory, and then you know this idea that you can, uh, yourselves and others are continue at threat. Have you seen much? I know you're on the foreign ministry side, but you talk with a lot of folks. You know, the, the way I try to... Um the way I see the situation is that we're still in the stage, maybe that stage will never end because I, I figured that it might have ended by now, that we're driven by, uh, by, the, by the battlefield. Yep. Uh, that means that, um, and I'm you know, guilty in this as well, that we're so much happy when, when we see uh, Ukraine winning. Yep. You know, last autumn, you know, the counteroffensive, taking back to two major uh, cities, you know, everything, you know, everybody in high spirits. You know, you would see a lot of visits, a lot of pictures being taken. Everybody wants to be a part of victory. When Ukraine is stuck, then, you know, the debate starts, right. you know, so how that will, will end. Uh, and I don't think that's the right approach, honestly. I think that we still need to, uh, we need to have a proper conversation about the end goal and an end game. And, uh, and take it from there. And I know that it's not, uh, not easy. You know, the, the, the points uh, are different. I mean, there are countries on one side of Atlantic who see it differently. You know, U.S. might, might see it differently. I mean, but we need to talk about this. This, is, this has to happen. Because if we, uh, if we don't agree on this, and if mm -hmm. just uh, the battlefield drives our decision-making process, then it's... First of all, it's incredible heavy load on the, the soldiers yeah. fighting in the battlefield. Like now, for example, the conversation is about the, the possibility of counteroffensive. And the, the, the understanding is if, it's, if they're successful... A Ukrainian counteroffensive. Yeah, yeah. Ukrainian counteroffensive. If they're successful, most likely you know, the support will, will continue. If they're not, at this point, then you know we are starting to hear mm -hmm. all the conversations that maybe you know something a different approach need need to happen. So can you imagine? I mean the generals and you know just the you know those those guys who are actually doing fighting yeah. for them you know to be told that look you know make it or break it. I don't think that's that's a viable solution. So my point is that we need to commit you know we need to commit to the end goal because what we're what we all of us are fighting for what Ukraine is fighting for it's not just you know few hundred kilometers of territory. It's either having aggressive Russia continuously fighting with its neighbors, uh, being partnered with China, and you know, offering a lot of more disruption mm -hmm. to the global security, or actually stopping it here and now. So that's, that's a major question. We're fighting for this <clears throat> decades-long vision and goal of a Europe whole free and at peace. Um, we, we thought that we have accomplished that. Uh, you know, we thought that um, we've accomplished that with uh, rules and regulations and agreements, international organizations, mm -hmm. treaties, diplomacy. And unfortunately, we still have not admitted that. Yet. But the time will come when we will have to really look through, through what worked and what not. You know, one example, NATO works yeah, uh, still, I mean, as a, as a security architecture. Yeah. Uh, OSC, not necessarily so. You talked about uh, we need to come together on an end goal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure I understand President Zelensky's end goal. Uh, is his end goal the same as what the transatlantic community is looking for or is hoping for? Um, 
I mean, what I would like to hear is a way clearer commitment to President Zelensky's 10-point uh, peace plan. Uh, and admitting that we have a capacity in the West with all the industrial might that mm -hmm. we have to assist Ukraine that it is able to recover the territories that it has lost. We have that. And somehow, but probably by saying that, you know, we feel that it's, it's committal and then if we commit it, then we know kind of we're in this for a long, long game. And therefore, it's kind of you know, going in, in, in batches. Uh, but it, that, that makes way more difficult for Ukraine. That gives hope to Putin yeah. uh, that time is on his side, that maybe this is actually the last batch. If it is, then, you know, all I need is patience and some Wagner groups. So, I mean, our, our commitment to Ukraine has to be way more vocal. And uh, with that, that might change also Putin's calculations. I would, I would agree with you 100%. Um, I believe that um, collectively, so I'm not just pinning it on any particular leader, uh, that we have not had the hard public discussions uh, about what we really mean by we're in it till the end yeah. and we're there. Uh, I don't believe we've really posed Putin with a strategic dilemma. And NATO, uh, sorry, Ukraine and NATO would be a strategic dilemma for him. Um, you know, multi-layering a variety of effects, trainers uh, in Ukraine, U.S. and Western, but in particular U.S., to be able to help uh, either with training, uh, starting reconstruction in particular areas. We haven't posed that to him. Do you sense that there is not an appetite to be able to take that on, and that's why some of the big public discussions aren't happening? Again, to where you started earlier on escalation? Uh, I don't know the, the actual reason. I mean, there are multiple factors in this. Um, I would say probably it starts with what I said before, like, can we imagine Russia losing? What would it mean? Uh, could somebody worse than Putin come to power if he, if he falls? And all those things, so it's a, you know, a fear of, uh, of, yeah. of Russia, uh, upheaval, some sort of upheaval in Russia. So we try to argue that with the fall of Soviet Union, and you know, we, we were told that after Gorbachev, somebody way worse would come. And we had Yeltsin, and probably that was one of the most hopeful years that Russia has had in the hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, short, but still, I mean, it, it happened. Then there is a worry that, is it possible for Ukraine to, to win? Are they able? Would they be able? Um, you know, I call these ideas a, a myths, kind sure. of, that we, you know, we, we try to test, and then somehow we end up believing them ourselves. Then again, to dispel this myth, uh, the, the myth was that the key will fall in three days, uh, that Ukrainians would not be able to, uh, to learn how to use HIMARS, and they learned that in a week. Uh, then they would not be able to drive for Leopards, now they're driving it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they proved us wrong so many times that I, I really would feel uncomfortable doubting their ability. Right. So I think it boils down to the, to the capacity whether we're able to reinforce them, um, same, for example, that, uh, uh, that for Putin, uh, Crimea is a red line. Again, one of the yep. red lines that we, we created ourselves or we tend to believe ourselves. And, you know, when, when I listen to um, uh, some of the experts from, from Russia, you know, from the Russian opposition who are now living uh, uh, in the West, their argument usually is that actually Crimea is not a red line, but it's, a, it's a, the point which has to happen because this would be the only lesson that would start change within Russia. Because if, if it's out of the question, if some, you know, somebody would say, okay, we, we can talk about everything else except Crimea, that means that, it is, that the point has not been driven mm -hmm. home to, the, to its fullest. So the, the main point is that we, again, probably, you know, the, the concept, political concept, is that we need to <laughs> get away with, with fear and, you know, and instead of fear, let's, let's prepare for the eventualities, different eventualities, and be, be prepared for them. We have the means for that. So you use the word red line 15 years ago. Uh, 15, well, we're one, one month away from 15 years ago when the Bucharest summit happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, Georgia and Ukraine uh, were on the cusp of getting membership action plan. 
and then I was with the presidential delegation at the time, so I, I was then, we were, myself and Secretary Gates, we were sent off to a, another room while the president and the NAC uh, met at the highest levels to figure out what to do about Georgia and Ukraine. Ultimately, the decision was the, they would not be granted MAP, but the language would be, will one day become members. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a red line for Putin 15 years ago uh, is when that happened. Um, you just mentioned Crimea in red lines. What I'm sensing from what you're saying is that Putin will declare these red lines. Um, we ourselves are now forcing ourselves to say, well, we don't want to cross that line because we saw either what happened in Georgia or the first invasion of Ukraine. Do you believe where, the, given uh, how the Russian military has worked thus far, that the red line over Crimea uh, is something that is holding folks back, that is, uh, is only in our own minds? Or do you believe it's actually something that could trigger another phase if Ukraine was able to, and the U.S. was able to support, or not just the U.S., but NATO were able to support? I think that's... Look, we're, we're trying the, the red line. The concept of red line for Putin is a, an instrument of control of the West, and uh, we've heard that so many times, not just from the you know from from Putin himself, but from you know Medvedev, you know whoever. Everything is red line. If you send a tank, you know just one tank, that's a red line. You know we'll we'll do this and that. I mean, we need to again. If we start with the end goal, and you prepare. For different eventualities, they they might escalate, and they escalated, with bombings of civilian uh, buildings, with Iranian drones, mm -hmm. with uh, now it's a you know still a chance of Iranian ballistic missiles. You know th there are eventualities, and we need to be prepared for those. But if we give in to the concept of red lines, then we are allowing ourselves to be controlled by narratives. Right. So I you know we are advocating that. Let's not give in. Let's not give in. We can stop this. We have means. We have the power. We have ability. And Ukrainians have the will. So it's, a, it's an excellent combination that is very rarely happened in, in history. Um, you know, for, for, you know the, the, the example of Afghanistan is very often used, where the will was not there. Right. Or at least it was not as, you know, as, as uh, self-presenting as in, in, in Ukraine. It was different. And yeah, so the combination was different, and it, not, it did not work out so well. Ukraine has it, and so it's now it's um, it's up to us. And um, yeah, so I mean those those red lines. There were so many of those. I so mean, it's a leadership and courage issue yeah. uh, on, amongst the allies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let me ask you one more on this Russia Ukraine, and then I want to transition to the summit and, and bring in a couple other issues. And I, I want to see what the audience has been emailing for questions. Um, but just to close on Russia Ukraine. Uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, accountability. Uh, it's something that uh, is talked a lot about here. I think it's something that absolutely must be done. Yeah. I think there, there's many mechanisms uh, to do this. Uh, your, your position on this and what does accountability really look like for what Russia has, uh, it's not even alleged, I mean I think it's pretty clear what has, what has happened. So uh, the, the main debate is um, whether what we have currently working, uh, meaning the uh, ICC investigation on war crimes uh, is enough. And uh, Lithuania, together with several other European countries and uh, global partners, are advocating that unfortunately this is not enough. Uh, additional crime, you know, it's called the mother of all crimes, uh, has to be investigated. It's a crime of aggression. Basically, a political decision to attack your neighbor, mm -hmm. and attack another country, and, uh, and occupy its territories. Because what we've seen with um, uh, when it comes to uh, war crimes, usually, in most cases, it is the soldier that has committed the crime. If he's, he's or she is apprehended, uh, given testimony, you know, you have all the proof, then he or she is convicted. It very rarely goes uh, up, the goes chain the, yeah, up the chain. You might get your hands on, on, on the general who gave the order. But then again, it's a very rare occasion that the general would give an order to commit war crime, you know, to, uh, to attack civilians, to you know, rape civilians, whatever. And all these things, they're very, very difficult to prove. It has happened. It has happened before, but it's, it's difficult. Uh, so now the problem is to go all the way up, the, up the chain of command to the political leadership, 
I mean, there's very little hope that that, that will happen. So, but the decision to attack Ukraine, that has happened. It was televised. The, I think that the voting was televised. So, so it's quite clear that mm -hmm. the, there are people who took it upon themselves to, uh, to bear this burden and to make the step. So I think that we have all the proof that is, that is necessary actually to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to convict uh, leadership uh, on because of act of, of aggression. So now the, the difficult part is. The difficult part is, so how do you do that? Because there's, uh, there are not so many precedents uh, globally of, of how, do you do th uh, how do you do this. The ICC cannot um, cover the act of aggression. Mm -hmm. So most likely uh, a special tribunal has to be created. Um, there are people who are saying, and, and countries who are saying that maybe... Um, Outside of the UN, so therefore out, it's not vetoed. Uh, so uh, there are two ways that U UN can, can establish a tribunal. One way is uh, um, Security Council, so that's a veto. Obviously that's not going to happen. But um, legal expertise says that General Assembly vote, ah. a majority vote, would suffice. And that is doable. That is possible to achieve. Uh, the main obstacle going that direction is whether it is possible and expected to have, you know, what we nominally call 140 votes. Mm -hmm. It is what we have managed to achieve and condemnation of Russia on its attack and, and you know, there have been quite successful votes in, in the UN. And people would say, okay, so is it possible to have 140 votes on special tribunal? And I don't think that's possible, you know, because the, the points of view will diverge. Right. But it is possible to have a majority that would establish a legal institution that would, uh, under the umbrella of UN, mm -hmm. uh, would look into the act of aggression from the legal standpoint and then you know, try to charge the people responsible for it. Um, so this is, this is still ongoing debate. But again, going back to you know, political uh, conversation, I think it's incredibly important. Because also in Zelensky's plan, but you know, from, from our perspective, two things that are vital. One thing is winning the war, mm -hmm. and then charging those who, who started it. This is how you make sure, or at least you know, try to make sure, that the next war does not happen. Because there is a responsibility if you start it. If there is no responsibility, if you sit to negotiate with the same person who, you know, who committed the crime, then it's, you know, at least from my perspective, it's an invitation to, uh, for another round. I said I wasn't going to uh, continue, but you just gave me one thing, reparations. So uh, whether it's paying uh, some kind of um, compensation to the families of those that were killed or it's for rebuilding. rebuilding. Yeah. Um, should it come out of Russian state money? Should the, you know, there's a lot of seized assets and things, yeah. and there's a debate about oligarch money, fair, Russian state money, it's a different story. It's not either or situation. I would, I would think that it's both. Uh, yes, there's a lot of uh, seized um, assets, uh, money and other, otherwise. I definitely think that it can be used and should be used to rebuild, uh, rebuild Ukraine. But we always reminded ourselves that one of the things that we're defending in Ukraine and globally is the rule of law. Correct. And that binds us as well. That means that despite any other fact, we still have to abide by laws and regulations that, you know, that keep our society intact. That then goes as well for the seized, uh, seized assets. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had some conversations here in, in Washington that there are some best minds in the legal world putting their um, heads on to the, the how, to, how to solve this. I'm sure that they will find a solution, offer it to politicians, and we'll get a go-ahead. But then again, going back to Zelensky's plan, Three main points, you know, winning the war, taking territories back, uh, punishing those who, you know, who started it, and reparations, rebuilding the country by the, by the country who, who started it. So um, for many it sounds idealistic, but you have to stick to it if you want to rebuild uh, the war that we have. Sounds pretty sound and reasonable yeah. in many ways. All right, let's transition to the Vilnius Summit. So, <clears throat> again, in four months, uh, Vilnius will be able to host uh, the latest of the NATO summits. So it finds itself in between uh, last year's Madrid summit and the 75th anniversary of NATO, which will take place next April uh, here in Washington. Uh, your summit should stand alone, but in many ways it also helps to connect uh, those two 
and can be a bridge to Washington. And um, you know, a lot of our conversations about Ukraine, what could potentially a 75th look like, 75th summit look like if the, either the war is still going or it's not, uh, the war isn't ended on Ukraine's terms. But that's for another conversation down the road. I want to talk to you about Vilnius. Um, so it's a historic opportunity for your country to, um, to showcase not only what it is uh, you bring to the alliance, but also showcase your beautiful city. There's a lot potentially on the agenda. Ukraine obviously will dominate some, but there's some non-Ukrainian aspects to the agenda. In your mind, what does the Washington, I'm sorry, the Vilnius summit look like in terms of success? Where does work still need to be done? Well, I think that first of all, having summits in, in Vilnius, which geographically itself is uh, 40 kilometers away from, from Belarusian border, is a pretty strong message to anybody who might be interested in thinking of you know, challenging, challenging NATO. Uh, having, you know, all the Western Western leaders and main partners of, of NATO uh, visiting Vilnius, uh, that alone is a, is a very strong message that, you know, we're, we're able to, to, to handle whatever threats uh, are there, you know, even 40 kilometers away. So that's, that's a very strong strategic, a strategic message. When it comes to more practical things, I think that the main two debates or three debates will be happening First of all, um, the defense of Eastern flank. Mm -hmm. There have been promises uh, made and assessments made in Madrid. So I think that we'll have to assess uh, the path that we walked in a year and to see where does it take us, you know, and how do we reach, how do we go further to, to Washington summit? Um, I think that what Eastern flank countries will be looking for is even possibly even stronger wording on Russia. As we began our conversation, Russia being as a vital threat, mm -hmm. and uh, so historic that in Madrid, NATO for the first time since the end of the Cold War actually declared Russia a threat to the territory. Yeah. So you'd like to see that language built? Uh, yes, and even possibly if, if if you know if we would find an agreement, even uh, expand it, because there are. I mean, now we're starting to see strategic implications of Russia winning or losing, and uh, midterm to long term. You know, the, the world, not just the European continent, not just the trans transatlantic area, w will depend on the outcome in Ukraine mm -hmm. and how that will, you know, how that, that will shape uh, all of us. So I think that is one, one very important point. And to add to that also, how practically do we uh, handle that threat? You know, so what sure. changed throughout the year? You know, how much uh, the e countries of Eastern flag have been reinforced? Uh, are they able to handle the, the threat that we've established in, in Madrid? Or did anything at all, you know, did, did anything at all change? Meaning, are they able to, meaning you and your other uh, Eastern flank allies, able to handle on your own what, was, what the declaration means? And uh, have the allies, as part of Madrid, honored their commitments to I, reinforce? That, I think, you know, from what I'm hearing, that uh, the, the, the countries who, again, Eastern flank countries, you know, uh, who looked into the text in Madrid, so, you know, specifically looking there for reassurances, additional reassurances. I'm quite convinced that they will look back and what, you know, what did we achieve? Uh, did our strategic posture in the Eastern flank change or not? Admitting that the threat is unprecedented. So you mean actually change, not on paper? Yes, exactly. Okay. So that, that, that might be uh, asked as one of the Conversation points. So, in some ways, that's a re Vilnius with this aspect becomes a report card. Uh, it's sort of a check on. I I would think that it will. I think it's actually unavoidable. You know, even though you know we're saying that look, you know, let's pave path for forward, and we're always doing that. But still, you have to reflect because the environment has changed, and we'll be in the heart of that changed environment. Mm -hmm. It's actually in Vilnius. You know, you could take Warsaw, Vilnius, but yeah. you know, we're one of the closest capitals, NATO capitals. Yeah when it comes to the country uh, on the other side, to the red territory, so to say. So it's a good place to have this uh, reflection. It's a good place to have this, this, this um, conversation. So we'll see about that. Um, I think that we'll talk about Ukraine a lot. That's, that goes without question. And uh, not just the commitments, practical commitments, but there will also be a, a discussion about the political path. You know, the, the request to join NATO is on the table, uh, even though it's a piece of paper. But in my eyes, it's an elephant in the room that very difficult to avoid talking about. Um, so again, there is a, a
quite wide divergence of, of views of how to handle this. You know, what, what can be offered, what can't be offered. Um, again, as a, as a host, uh, you know, representative from host country, I would uh, very much like to see more talking about what we can do. More about the positives than what we cannot and should not should not do should not offer or should not talk about and all these things. So I smiled when you said can and can't do because, <clears throat> in theory, anything, it's all a can. Yeah. It just requires leadership uh, and courage, right? So yeah, and um, I think that China will be on on the table as well mm -hmm. uh, as a part of the conversation. Uh, for the first time, we had this discussion in. Um, in Madrid, uh, China made it to the you know to the documents of of, uh, of NATO already. I think that we'll will continue that, especially if our uh, Asia Pacific partners join in the, the conversation, which they're invited, if I understand. Is, yes, I, if, yeah, they, I, I'm not sure whether they accepted the invitation, but maybe that's in due time. That will happen in due time. Uh, but anyway, I would assume that this this will be a significant part of conversation, and especially since now there's an added layer uh, regarding the possibility of weapon transfers from, from China to Russia, which is uh, uh, a lot debated, and I don't think that this mm -hmm. uh, debate will, uh, you know, will, will evaporate uh, in, in upcoming four months. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Ukraine, or back to Ukraine as it relates to the summit for a second. If you're, and I understand that uh, the SecGen, uh, in cooperation with your government, has extended an invitation to President Zelensky to attend the summit. But if you're sitting in Kyiv, um, and you're weighing, do I go or don't I go? What does NATO need to offer the president, President Zelensky, to make it enticing for him to go? As, and so it's not just another show, show up, make the thank you, and then make a pitch for things. I mean, in your mind, what should Vilnius have as a, I hate the term, but a deliverable or momentous thing that would justify President Zelensky coming? Um, you know, I... I'm sure that you know President Zelensky. You know he's uh, uh, excellent in making decisions. Sure. You know when, when it comes to, you know, you know, where to show up and where not. I mean, so far that he has been extremely successful. I have to say, um, from NATO's part, what I would like to see is that us being serious. Um, I I often feel uncomfortable as as a you know as a member state of EU or NATO and praising ourselves, patting ourselves on the back. You know, we did so much. Yeah, but they're fighting the war. They're dying there every day. And we, you know, we just give out some money. We give out some, yeah, we have a very tough debate in the parliament. You know, the opposition is bashing us that we're doing this and that wrong. Yeah, but they're fighting there in Bakhmut, dying in trenches. That's quite a different ball game. And uh, therefore, I would not like us to see, you know, saying, look, you know, we're mm -hmm. so awesome. You know, we did this thing so right, but they did it. We just helped out. Yeah. And um, so that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's the only thing that I, you know, I'm yeah. putting that to, my, to myself. Right. Um, as, um, uh, well, as I, I can be the provocative one. <laughs> I'm not in government, right? I, I believe that there has to be some kind of actionable commitment that can help Ukraine get to membership by the 75th. I think there needs to be establishment of a NATO training mission Ukraine. I think there needs the, defining what's in the comprehensive assistance package that was adopted at Madrid for what medium and long term. We need to send the messages, again, I have the freedom to say this, uh, yeah. you may not, that we're not going anywhere and we believe in Ukraine's sovereign ability to defend itself for the long term. I can tell you as much that I truly believe that there is a political path for uh, Ukraine to NATO. Let that be the takeaway from this conversation. <laughs> uh, where do uh, Finland and Sweden fit in for the Vilnius agenda? Uh, that will definitely be a, be a part of, of the conversation. I'm still hoping that it will be a part of celebratory part. This is where we will be able to say that we did a lot uh, if, if they're in. Um, and still, I mean, there is a, a window of opportunity for, uh, for Turkey and uh, Stockholm and Helsinki to find find an agreement. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of work being put into this, by you know by by Washington, by uh, Brussels, many other capitals, you know, trying to uh, to figure this out. Uh, it is important to us directly, not just a part of NATO, but as a part of the Baltic Nordic region. It affects our security directly. 
not just Swedish, not just Finnish, yeah. but the whole region. We're talking about the Baltic Sea, which is also used for Russian uh, naval uh, operations. So we're very much care uh, that uh, that Finland and, and Sweden join join NATO as soon as possible. So I'm, I'm you know I'm very much hopeful that it will happen. I would not go into scenarios sure. if that does not happen, but you can imagine the the mood mm -hmm. that would be there. Um, I always like to look at dates and anniversaries and timelines. And so next year will be 20 years that you formally acceded to NATO membership. It's also 30 years since the Partnership for Peace was initially mm -hmm. uh, kicked off, which uh, uh, started the opportunity for you and for Ukraine and for Russia and others to actually have this opportunity. Um, Belarus uh, also was extended that opportunity as well. We haven't really talked about Belarus other than you can see it from your, from your kitchen window. <laughs> um, where does Belarus fit into this picture of a future European security architecture post-war? What does that look like? Well, geopolitically and uh, strategically, uh, for us, it's, it's a major worry having 700 kilometers of, of border and Belarus now being more of a training ground for, for Russian troops or mm -hmm. operation ground you know, for their attacks on, on Ukrainian territory. So definitely it is a worrisome neighbor to say the very least. Um, politically, I think that they are in a situation where their uh, sovereignty is heavily limited yeah. uh, by, by Russians. I'm not sure how much you know, freedom is there still you know, it's very difficult to, to talk about this because we are uh, difficult to assess. Uh, but what gives me hope and what we cannot forget is that there are, you know, I would like to call it a two sovereignties. You know, one is political, uh, geopolitical, and uh, there was another one is spiritual that lives within, within mm -hmm. us where people actually want freedom and they've shown it, showed it in 2020 after the stolen election. Yep when we've seen hundreds of thousands of people, up to 600,000 people went out to the streets in an in a authoritarian country, heavily oppressive country. They went out, uh, yes, being afraid of for their lives, and many of them are still in jails. Uh, you know, the country that has more than 1,300 political prisoners still. Mm, but that spiritual sovereignty is still there. I'm absolutely confident about that. And we cannot forget this. We cannot let that, uh, that die because out of this sovereignty, out of this uh, feeling that actual political sovereignty uh, can, uh, uh, can come back. So you use that, you used a term, I, I may not have the exact wording right, but they're not in complete control of their uh, sovereignty. But limited, if that, uh, limited, uh, sovereignty. limited sovereignty. Yeah. But if that spark is able to turn into um, peaceful uprising, possible change in leadership, um, uh, in democratic leadership. Do you, I, I believe that Europe would welcome Belarus, but do you believe Belarus could break free of a Russian orbit? I think yes. Uh, I think yes, and uh, this is one of the possible outcomes of Ukrainian victory. That really whole, rechange the landscape. Yeah, it can re totally rechange the landscape. And we're already feeling this. We're already feeling that in, uh, in Armenia, Azerbaijan, for example, in Central Asia, uh, where Russian pull was very strong, uh, strategically important, and not so much anymore. We've seen European Union being, um, becoming a major actor in, uh, in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. You know, Charles Michel mm -hmm. offering uh, you know, a, a peace environment for p peace consultations between, between the two countries in Brussels, and that's happening. So um, that is a, one of the main outcomes of, of, of war in Ukraine. And Russia is n less of a geopolitical actor than it was before. I'm not saying that it cannot rebuild, and I'm not saying that it's permanent, but mm -hmm. at least at this point it's, it's changing. And we have to be mindful about this. So I'm, I'm very extremely happy of what the outcomes. I mean, the, the situation that Europe is in getting itself involved in, uh, in South Caucasus. Um, uh, I'm glad that Moldova, is also becoming a, a, a candidate country to EU. These are very good developments. But when it comes to Belarus, you know, we tend to, in many cases, we tend to align in our minds uh, the people and the dictator. 
kind of it's all the same sure. thing. And for example, in Russia, it's I think it's more of the same thing because people actually support the actions of of, of, of Mr. Putin. But I think that in Belarus there's a different different case. Therefore, you know, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, who's uh, you know from yeah. from our perspective and our mind, is an elected president. Uh, who found a refuge in, in Lithuania. So we're very much supporting her. And I think that everybody you know, <laughs> should, should see her as yeah. a, that representation of uh, this um, sovereignty um, of, of Belarusian people. Will she be at the summit? Well, she will, I, I think that she will definitely be in Vilnius. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, China is not a small topic. So let's no. see what we can do with it in the time remaining. Um, and I desperately would like to see what the audience has asked for questions, but I don't want to be rude given we're eyeball to eyeball. Um, China, let's start with NATO uh, summit first, and then I want to get into the bigger sort of what's happening with Lithuania, uh, Europe, and China. Uh, but um, China, as you've mentioned, came up at Madrid, mm -hmm. uh, and there was this idea that there should be at least a recognition of the threat uh, that uh, China poses in the Indo-Pacific and that the alliance should be spending uh, more time thinking about this. There have been some that have written post-Madrid, and I just wonder if it's picking up any traction for Vilnius, the establishment of a NATO-China commission, sort of like a NATO-Russia commission. Mm -hmm. The idea being that, look, we need to have a mechanism for dialogue so that there is no miscommunication and understanding. Um, I can tell by your facial expression this may be new to you, but give me your thoughts on whether there should be a NATO-China commission. Well, uh, it doesn't have to be for Vilnius, but let's yeah, just yeah, say, I should there it. be uh, one? You know, I, I can tell you where, where discussion is, and I think that the discussion now is mostly uh, revolving around whether is it okay for NATO to go outside of North Atlantic region. Mm -hmm. And uh, I myself, I'm personally an advocate of... Uh, a more global approach, because I don't... NATO with global partners, not a global NATO. Uh, yeah, exactly. Na yep. NATO with global and global perception, so to say, okay. so that we see uh, that the world is an interconnected place. I mean, it's not a new, new thing in the 21st century to, to say this. So uh, the you know, limitless, uh, without boundaries partnership between Russia and, and, and China brings China from uh, Indo-Pacific region into into North Atlantic. You know, if uh, China would become a, a contributor, not just for war. Let's let's you know sure. keep the war uh, at least at, for this uh, for this question outside. But as a contributor for Russia's defense, if Russia is starting to rebuild and you know it's heavily sanctioned, it's unable to rebuild the most sophisticated technology, and China is helping with that. And rebuilding, you know, building factories near St. Petersburg, and uh, so is it part of uh, North Atlantic mm -hmm. security? You know, is it an issue? Yeah. I think definitely it is. So you, you kind of, it's it's so much interconnected now that it's impossible to to avoid it. So therefore, theoretically, I would agree the direction that you uh, you said that the, the conversation might take, uh, because I think that it is unavoidable that we would be touched as NATO if uh, certain actions happen in Russia, even in Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. What do you make of those that make the claim that, look, Europe needs to be focused on the Russia mm -hmm. uh, threat because the U.S. needs to flex with its Asian allies towards China. Do you believe it's zero sum? And do you believe Europe feels the same way about China right now, strategic threat, as America does? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but again, there, there are different voices in Europe. Uh, I, I think that what we're seeing now is we're seeing way more um, voices in the eastern flank. You know, yeah, it started in Lithuania, but now you hear, you know, Czech Republic, uh, other Baltic countries joining in into the more similar approach toward China uh, as, you know, as, as, as we see in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, you might call it alignment, but you might call it also uh, the lessons from the past. You know, we tend to recognize uh, similar um, threats, so to say, that we've seen, we've been warning about, you know, coming from Russia, and we're seeing similar things coming from, coming from China. Therefore, I think that there is this, this approach. Not necessarily everybody sees that uh, in, in Europe. 
Yep. Yeah, there, there is this divergence that we talked about. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of uh, dependence sure. uh, built on China when it comes to supply chains, investments, whatnot. Un I mean, I would say that's quite unfortunate that it's still being reinforced, even though I would think that it's a, it's a high time to uh, look at that more, more seriously. Exactly the same way that you know people were warning about you know, dependencies on uh, Russia's natural resources. You know, we were saying that look, you know, when uh, Ukraine was attacked for the first time and uh, Nord Stream One was inaugurated, we thought that it's not the best thing to do. Then Nord Stream Two, and then yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we have huge problems with uh, gas <laughs> gas deliveries yeah. to Europe. Thankfully, they were um, sold during the, the winter, uh, during the last year. But still, it showed how much dependency on non-democratic country with aggressive tendencies can be, can be harmful to us. So we, we tend to feel that and uh, warn again, you know, let's, let's at least not build it stronger. Let's diversify, look for the ways, you know, how to uh, mitigate the risks that might come out of it. Mm -hmm. You talked about the economic dependence of Europe. Your country has taken a rather brave approach that has led to a decoupling, I guess, yes. uh, we could use that term, over Taiwan yeah. and allowing um, a Taiwanese office, using that word, yeah. Taiwanese, to open in, uh, in Lithuania and vice versa. Yeah. And so uh, as for, for the audience and for others, it's led to a decoupling from the Chinese side and a ban that's even gone not just from primary items, but anything that has Lithuanian content. Um, Bring us up to speed on where that stands and where do you think it's going to uh, end and why you took such a brave, brave stance. Well, I think that it's, uh, in many cases, it, it comes from you know, values-based foreign policy. that We uh, tend to, to call it that way. That means that we are supporting and we feel that it, it has to uh, happen in a more broader scale. That means that democracies have to support each other. Uh, especially those who depend uh, very strongly not just on or not on military might uh, but on rules and regulations that uh, that hold our world together uh, so that came the decision came from there uh, the reaction Chinese reaction was extremely harsh I don't think that any other country globally has uh, has seen that um, but what happened afterwards that is that actually we came out uh, more resilient and I would say even stronger mm -hmm. Yes, we, we, we were forced to decouple. We were forced to diversify our supply chains, find ways where to bring uh, the things that are needed in, in Lithuania from other sources, um, and find new partners uh, globally. So we strengthened our partnerships in Indo-Pacific with uh, opening new embassies uh, and, and, and then you know, pushing our trade to, you know, to, to Japan and Australia and other countries. And it has gone tremendously throughout just throughout the last year, 40% of growth in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, also, I think that um, why specifically, you know, Indo-Pacific? Because there was a lot more understanding what we're going through, uh, what Lithuania is going through. And I would say that there was even some sympathy yeah. to, to, to us, a country that is facing such uh, aggressive measures by, by PRC. So that worked out quite well. To add to that, um, we've started, um, via European Union, we started a, a panel in WTO that was joined by the major partners in G7 and other global, Great. Uh, global friends. Um, my belief is that led to a reduce in restrictions from China. So, so it caused them to back down a little. A little bit, yeah, because you know, they have to answer questions for the panel. Uh, you know why Lithuania was removed from the custom systems mm -hmm. completely, so we're back in the custom systems, um, and uh, so there is there is trade. That means that we already can can bring stuff from from China. We can sell uh, some some things to China. But uh, the message was very clear to the businesses, not just in Lithuania but globally. Look, if you make a, a foreign policy decision that China does not like, there will be uh, there will be repercussions, yeah. and. Um, as in any other democratic country, you know, there will be decisions uh, because people feel strongly about this. You know, some of them feel strongly about Taiwan, some of us feel strongly about Uyghurs uh, in, in labor yeah. camps, temp, uh, camps. And um, I'm sure that we are definitely not, uh, not the last uh, 
country to, to, to take a stand. Doing the, right thing, doing the right thing takes courage sometimes, and your country is, uh, is a symbol of that. Mr. Minister, we've reached the end of our time, so let me say in Lithuanian, achu. Thank you. Uh, sure. It's been great having you here. Uh, good luck with the summit and everything that you're trying for. Look forward to keep the conversation going with you and your countrymen and women. And thanks for all that you're doing uh, on Ukraine. I completely can sympathize that, uh, yes, uh, we can supply things, but it's the Ukrainians that are doing the fighting and the dying, and we, they deserve all of our support and our love. And so with that, let me just say thank you to everyone who tuned in today for, or this morning for this uh, wonderful conversation. I hope you found it enjoyable. And stay tuned for future conversations uh, by CSIS and my colleagues. As, I, as they would say in Lithuanian, visogero.